Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery programming series for our current show, The Nexus of Art and Health, curated by Sienna Brown. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Lisa Merida Pates. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is listening is in listen only mode. So please feel free to use that chat function and we'll ask those questions during the Q&A portion of the hour. Next, live captioning is available. Be sure to access those by clicking on the closed caption icon and selecting show subtitle. Um, also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up, or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right, and now to you, Lisa. Kat, thank you so much. I'm so excited to give an artist talk for the Wright Gallery and to uh, talk about uh, the work that's led me to the pieces in the gallery. So thank you. Um, so, I thought that I would start out this talk with a quote that I've looked at for years. Um, I went to the Art Academy of Cincinnati. I uh, graduated in, in 91 with a BFA in sculpture and photography and went on to grad school at UC uh, and graduated in 91 with an emphasis in ceramic sculpture. Um, since then, I, I have been looking at this quote. Um, I always loved Frida Kahlo, and I, I never knew why and how, or how meaningful, I should say, this, this quote became to me. Um, it, it's really, it's really been wonderful to um, explore her journey that she went through as an artist. And I understand um, with the journey that is in front of me, I understand where she was coming from, why she painted in her and when she was in bedridden for months. I understand why Henry Matisse, who I studied for years, painted with his toes at the very, the latter part of his life. I, it, it's that internal drive that we have to create. And um, so, so I'm, I, I'm just in awe when I see other artists especially in the show at the Rife, um, and hear the journey uh, that they have in front of them and see the accommodations that, that they use to keep creating. And that's what I do in my studio. Um, I, with a background in ceramics, um, I um, know how important it is to publish your work, to get it out in the world. Um, I was told by a really smart person years ago uh, to keep making work, get it out there, and someone will see it and fall in love with it ask you to be in a show uh, and ask you to tell them more about your work want to collect your pieces and that's what I've tried to do just keep making keep my head down and keep working in this studio um this was an recent article in ceramics Ireland and uh, I published a uh, work articles that I I have written and um, been reviewed in Stories Ireland and this was uh, a it's a really beautiful magazine and I'm honored to be a part of it um, and it, they were talking about uh, some of my newer work 
uh, the mixed media work. So not just ceramics. Um, here's another recent publication um, that it, I, I really publish in every every kind of article that I can in every kind of publication. This is for interior designers. This publication uh, it goes out around the country and. If someone is designing um, a building um, or uh, an interior space, then this is the work that they can, um, they can, if they're interested, they can contact me. Um, another ceramic um, uh, magazine book. Um, we're we're just so blessed to have in this area the American Ceramic Society is in Columbus, outside of Columbus actually, and um, they they are wonderful. They've been such a great resource for me over the years and um, have taken articles of mine that have been in uh, their magazines and actually created books uh, that Studio Ceramics is, a, is one of those. Um, they took that article that was in Pottery Making Illustrated and uh, created a book uh, with other great artists um, and very informative techniques for ceramics. Um, 500 Raku is, uh, is one of the 500 books uh, by Lark Books. Uh, they're, they're a wonderful publication for uh, ceramics as well. And they're always looking for new techniques in the ceramic field. So I encourage anyone who wants to write about something, uh, a technique that they're working on, I encourage them to look at uh, large books. And you can see the 500 series. They have 500 Raku, 500 beads, 500. It's just, they they really publish everything. So another great resource. Um, um, more publications. Um, I, I try, I try to, to uh, make sure that I get the work out there. <laughs> <laughs> from the students really it takes a lot of time it you know it's a good uh full-time job 50 hours in the studio every week which I love I couldn't do anything else but the other end of it is on the computer another 50 60 hours on the computer getting the work out there applying for shows writing grants uh, applying for publication opportunities and such as it's all part of the process that we go through. Um, speaking of publications, this is how I found um, an artist that I've looked at for a long time. His name is Andy Goldsworthy. And um, his work it was always so powerful for me to look at because not, his work doesn't remain intact. The only the only record of his work is through photography and through these publications. So it's really important um, to for him to get a good image, have a good photographer or learn how to shoot your your images yourself and um, record what you're working on. It's um, been so influential to me to watch his work progress. Um, 
I have always drawn. Um, that's a really big part of my work. Um, I sometimes I draw with uh, traditional drawing materials. Other times I draw with wire and stain on the ceramic surfaces. Sometimes I draw with wire and space uh, and now with paper. Um, so I, I'm trying to um, investigate um, process uh, and technique uh, in the material itself in 2D and 3D. And so that's where it's going. I have lots of sketchbooks. Uh, you can see the Frito Kahlo uh, <laughs> reference. Um, that was the self portrait. My dad, I I grew up in Verona, Kentucky, and my dad was a taxidermist, and we we had a slaughterhouse uh, at home where he did his work, and so you'll see the uh that common thread throughout my work i've saved a lot of money by being an artist that i would have spent in a psychiatrist's office um just uh kind of uh work out some of the themes and in, in that i've been thinking about and look at the same images that my dad looked at, but I see that we look at them in a different way. And we've, we were really able to come full circle um, because of that. So that brings me to some early pieces uh, with that in mind. You can see in the center of the screen, the sort of the the works they were cheese cheesecloth actually coated in wax um and tobacco and graphite um and so a lot of drawing on the surface with materials but they were they really had the the essence of the hanging carcass that that I was looking at in my childhood. Um, it's really difficult to bring a date home um, when I was younger, uh, especially during deer season. And um, so needless to say, I've been a vegetarian my entire life, basically. Um, I also, uh, was blessed to, to uh, have grew up my grandfather's tobacco farm as well. He lived five minutes from me. He had a 300 acre tobacco base farm. And uh, this this work, uh, I, I would thatch similar to uh, the way the the farmer, thatches the tobacco stalks together in the barn to hang for uh to get ready to strip them to sell and um i you know what what papa always uh wanted that's where he made his money was stripping the tobacco leaves from the stalk so then after that was finished, he would throw hundreds of tobacco shocks along the hillside to sort of uh, become part of the earth again. And um, I, I got really influenced by my dad's uh, slaughterhouse environment and Papa's tobacco uh process and started using the tobacco um to thatch huts uh together 
and make structures. This, if anyone is familiar with the Crone Conservatory in Ohio, it's the largest uh, in the United States, actually. Um, and um, I started making this cocoon forms uh, that were reminiscent of bodies for me too. And using the stalks, I you'll see on the right hand side, I was coating and then with wax and graphite, uh, you can see the difference of the coloration and began drawing on the surfaces of those as well. So um, I was I was also making uh, tree supports. Uh, I was thinking about the the animals that were that were making making the tree home for the winter, and 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 I kind of wanted to protect the tree. They were having issues at this park in Ohio and um, they had some some metal uh, fencing around and I didn't I, I didn't like that I, and I asked them to take it down and so I made some site specific tree protectors <laughs> um, I did a series of four and a half years uh, these uh, tree protectors and the structures that were encompassing spaces, uh, having a lot of fun building these these structures. I think that was um, uh, I, I learned a lot about the way things kind of fit together. Um, the piece on the right hand side in the bottom. That piece, if that gives you an idea, it's, it's about 12 foot tall. Uh, so it's very large. Um, very interested in the surface quality uh, and the, the wax and the graphite uh, allowing me to, to kind of char up that surface uh, and became very tactile with the tobacco stalks. I loved the way these pieces were really sensorial uh, where when you walked into the space, no matter if it was a small, small piece or the, you know, like the hut that you could walk into if you really wanted to, they really took over your senses, you, your nose started water running, your eyes water, you know, your, your throat, um, you, I got choked up uh, from the, the overall smell of the tobacco. Well, it was really wonderful, but very, very powerful. Like when you walked into like one of the, in the malls you could go into years ago, you would walk into a cigar shop and they would have it closed off and the smell was so powerful. It was really reminiscent of that kind of experience. Um, this, after that series, uh, I had the, the opportunity through, through a grant, um, they, it allowed me to go out west. And um, I, I haven't looked back since then. <laughs> the, uh, the sculptural qualities of the saguaro and the sculpted messes, even on the bottom right, the, the pile of rocks, just incredible to me. Um, the on the left hand side, the, the you can see the the levels 
of, of growth and the sedimentation of the iron deposits. I mean, it was really, really inspirational to me. Um, that led me to uh, create, start working with clay. I did not ever, besides digging it up in the creek, uh, when I was growing up, I've never really worked with clay until grad school. And so I had no idea what that stuff was. It was you know, I just knew it as Mother Earth. I didn't know that when you fired it, it became ceramic. It became this whole material. Well, two years that you see sitting with Rory Cartwright, um, he kind of... Uh, took me under his wing and uh, let me let me explore this stuff, but he still said, "Okay, it is it's dirt." But I place calculation. I you know I I I understood what I was working with, and um, you can see the influences of the the growth patterns of of these rock formations in this work the piece on the left is actually about four and a half feet tall and it that was before I knew to work sectional so that piece weighed close to 500 pounds <laughs> and and so after I made that piece Rick Cartwright uh, who my mentor um, said, Lisa, it's time to work sectional. And so, so I understood what that meant. So on the bottom right-hand side, you can see uh, how important with any ceramic process, any kind of clay you use, um, uh, it, it's heavy. And because there's so much water content uh, in in clay, even even after you fire it, there's always water in it. And um, uh, the three sort of diagonal uh, sections on the bottom right hand side. Well, there's actually four, but but the three major ones are sectional points that the pieces come apart. Uh, they're as light as they can be. They're so heavy. That piece is 62 inches on the right-hand side. So uh, it's very deceiving how tall they are, but um, um, I really didn't have any, any limitations of working with clay roy let me experiment and have fun with it um so um the bottom piece is uh i i didn't use a lot of glaze in this work uh glaze is just like glass former and it just it just kind of fits with with ceramic I won't go into the technical reason but it it just fits and and so that's why it when you fire it it's it it um creates this impervious uh layer to it um but I didn't like how with glaze for me for my work it it seems like it takes away from the form um and it, I wanted to investigate um creating sort of a matte finish that let the form speak and the rhythms of growth would would be highlighted by the shadows um in the work the piece in the bottom is is a, the same clay body, but um, I 
but it's in it's made from two different colors one black stain and one red iron uh and then i was hand building and carving and sanding all of this work is done that way and so i was very interested in the light and shadow which leads me to the next piece and and so again i'm using different stains of clay hand building with them and not glazing um the um the shininess that you see from the work is just burnished so burnishing is when you take a like a smooth stone or or you know uh similar to like sandpaper you could take a um uh smooth stone with oil and keep rubbing in the surface and um really pushing those molecules of clay together so tightly that it creates a sheen and that's how that is done the ones that aren't shiny are not burnished um i was very fortunate to uh to go back out west and i studied with dennis ott uh, who's a really fantastic potter. Um, I, I'm not a potter. I, I, I can throw, but I am not a potter. He is an amazing potter and amazing artist. And uh, I was able to do a baked potato sagger fire with him. Uh, the piece on the right is my sort of just a sketch that I did out there it is about a foot and a half tall um but again I cut it with a wire and then wrapped every section and with aluminum foil and we fired it with baked potato baked potato stickers are not glazed either and so I used wire uh, pennies, um, Kroger, cost cutter, dog food, which create a, it's, an, I'm sorry to say this, but you know, I'm, I'm sorry for the animals, but the Kroger dog food is wonderful for firings because it has, it's just made up of sulfates is there's not animal byproducts in there or if there is there's very little because it creates a great uh, uh color when you fire it um and so all the coloration that you see on the piece on the right hand side is just from that modeling effect of the fire hey and lisa yes we are at our halfway point, and I know you're only just to like maybe a fourth of the way through your slides, and you have such great imagery. I want to make sure that you can get through it. So I just wanted to give you that heads up. Thank you so much, Kat. Thank you. I will apologize. I've had coffee, everyone. <laughs> um, I will. Uh, I'll try to go quicker through these. This is um, a really important process. It was, I've always experimented with with the uh, alternative firings in ceramic. And this is paper clay. I started mixing my own batch. The book uh, down below with the teddy bear. Um, I wrote that. Uh, that book on paper clay came and published my recipe for this. The teddy bear is actually my oldest daughter's teddy bear, and I preserved it. She now owns it. And so that was the idea was experimenting to see if I could, in a gas kiln, burn out the teddy bear, create the ceramic material thick enough 
where I'm just using slip and and burn out the teddy bear so the ceramic ceramic element remained. Um, this was this is bronze. Um, this in the center, and um, I did a bronze cast lost wax process uh, where I took real, a real fish from Walmart. You can buy a in a package and made a clay mold, burned it out, covered it in wax, burned it out, and then made this the, the pit fire uh, container. It's a wall piece. Um, my dad, again, the, the whole taxidermy uh, element came through. My dad gave me um, his his paper molds of uh, what the taxidermist stretches the the animal hide over to, to mount. Um, I made a two part plaster mold. It's up in the the upper left hand side, and then would uh, inlay clay to the uh, to the mold, and then hand build the piece uh, hole again. Um, the left hand side uh, piece is porcelain, hand built porcelain. And it's referenced from um, the inside of a gourd, the, the gourd pulp. I just loved how skeletal it felt to me. Uh, here's another really great process um, uh, in clay pit fire. And these are sub pieces where you bury the ceramic ware in the earth and fire it over several days. And so it does not have glaze, but this is the colorants that you use flashed on from, from particular elements like we talked about. Um, another, another great, uh, pit fire process you can see we're encapsulating the work inside something that creates an atmosphere uh, this work it was I had so much fun doing it um cast glass making the the molds of, of clay and casting glass frets um, I'm using wire, copper wire, uh, inside the glass frit. And so the coloration that you see is just clear glass, but the copper oxidizes in the firing. And so it's flashing that, that teal and iridescent sort of, uh, coloration in the areas. Pretty cool. This um, on the left hand side is the blowfish, and it was inspirational to me. For, I loved the uh, I loved the beak the that was that was you know it looked skeletal to me, and the body just that uniform fluid form. I love the way the tail just gently moves. And it really spawned um, spawned a lot of work for me um, that lasted about five years. And bird beaks again. I, I love the skeletal, the function of, of that, the bird beaks in the skeleton it remains. This is porcelain and I'm incorporating wire in porcelain paper clay with uh, that coats fiberglass screen, like window screen. 
um, it becomes because it's porcelain, the the more that you fire to the vitrification point, which is like the the sweet spot in clay, the more translucent it becomes and hard. It's really really nice. This is uh, an example of drawing with wire and uh, brushing on uh, just just stain and then carving it out um, and exposing that that technique. An example of Raku. Raku has been a process that I love because of the immediacy of it. Um, it's an old Japanese technique of firing uh, ceramic ware. Um, and um, what we do in the Western world, we kind of, uh, we, well, I won't go in to all the technical stuff, but um, um, it's a really cool process where you're playing with fire and you're putting the wares in a hot kiln and opening the kiln up with tongs of protective wear, pulling the work out and um, um, putting it in something combustible that will burn when that when it starts burning you you close that environment and what happens is the flame needs oxygen to breathe when you deprive that atmosphere it surges with inside the body of the clay in the clays to get that inherent iridescent look which is is that's all of these pieces are right. So the bottom uh, right, right hand side of the painting on, that's what the glaze looks like. After that process, that Raku process, then up top you see that you get that subtle coloration or that, that, that really um, apparent look of Raku. And this is the process itself. We are opening the kiln, putting the combustibles, letting it burn. So all these pieces, you can you can see there's real small hints of color. That's very unpredictable with Raku, that's why I loved it so, because I could not control, you can control it somewhat, but you know, I mean, the piece on the left, you see the areas that are red, the piece on the right, that same glaze is blue or bluish green. It depends on the oxidation of reduction uh, that happens inside in 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 the center of the same place is a bright green. So you have to be okay. It's like Christmas when you open the kiln in any firing. You gotta be okay with it. Um, the another source of inspiration, um, artists that have been so important to me, a uh, Viola Frey. Uh, on the left hand side, I love her massive work that uh, that is always engaged me. Stephen Destabler, uh, his pieces are on the left. Um, I've enjoyed his work. The piece, uh, the the photograph on the right is from the Sequoia National Forest. Um, uh, I, I felt when I was there, uh, I felt like a speck on this earth. And when, it, when I left that environment, I really started creating uh, very totem-like works, which you'll see. 
um, created sort of in that environment in Sequoia, um, I found all of these, these great kind of frozen in time um, uh, sort of like uh, animals that were deteriorated and and we we found some bones in the uh, arranged in the forest that were just incredible uh the way that something deteriorated so i i really wanted to start creating these totems um for these for uh these bodies and that's what led me to the the Karen type work, uh, which this is some of that. Paying homage to, to things that have fallen. Another artist on the right hand side that I've always loved her work. Uh, Judy Chicago. I I follow her on Instagram too. <laughs> I love her work. Um, this is the uh, this piece is great. I love hers. Hey, Lisa, you have under ten minutes to get through the rest of it. Just to FYI, okay. I will. I will. Oh my gosh! So so again, I will whiz through some of the stuff because I have talked about it that on the left hand side that's my little daughter Lily who is she's got her own baby now and she's 23 but I always thought that was a great photo <laughs> here are the totem works that I was talking about another piece Frida Kahlo amazing and she says so many things that are that are I can identify with. Uh, on the left hand side uh, is my papa's um, farm, and the walnut tree that he planted, um, and it was always a tree to go back there. When I think of the farm, I think of papa in the tree. This has kind of led me to investigate all these materials that I've, I've worked with. Um, the, I'm weaving copper wire, steel wire, uh, coating it with porcelain paper clay, casting paper, um, staining paper, the bottom pieces, ceramic. And the other pieces are mixed media. Um, the piece pieces in the middle, the the one in the center, that's sixty two inches tall. It's very deceiving. The slide. I'm sorry. Uh, the piece on the left is a drawing. It's where I've just kind of pulled the paper. To, I kind of drew on the paper and it was a sketch for, for this one. Uh, these are smaller works, porcelain, paper, clay, over steel, and enamel, like a jeweler would use. And I love that. I'm using enamel. I'm loving that where you kind of use it just with water and brush it on. It's just a glass. That's all it is. And it's it's so compatible with clay. I'm hand building um, lots. Uh, this th These pieces were so fun to build. I started working, you know, I have, I have this background in clay, but I also love an art store. It's like Christmas when you go there. And um, these, this is made out of Sculpey, the heads and the hands. Sculpey clay, I'm loving it. I'm having fun with that. But the rest is porcelain paper clay. Um, here's some uh, porcelain 
uh, clay, cast paper, woven paper, woven copper wire, uh, cast glass in uh, that same process with uh, uh, ceramic as well. The piece on the, the left, the small little ring, that's a brand new piece. I just gave it to a friend. We traded it works. But it, I want to make another one like that. I have I have been firing grog, like a fire ceramic grog in the glass and love the tactile quality. Um, lotus pods on the right, uh, looking down out my window from my studio. I, I'm just, I've always been enamored and uh, excited about uh, shadow in the work. And I, that's just a piece that a uh, photograph that I love. Uh, this is my studio where I'm, I know I'm going fast. I want to make sure you see these. Um, I'm working in the entire house now, too, besides just one room. My husband is over it. <laughs> he said he's tired of living in an artist studio, but I'm loving working everywhere and uh, see, seeing work um, uh, in the entry hanging. Well, it, so it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm weaving paper, and this is on the bottom right. That's uh, liquid watercolor in starch, where I'm actually coloring the paper. Sometimes I use tea and coffee, uh, but I'm using watercolor too. Um, I'm using la a ladder now for the large pieces for the uh, to actually um, uh, serve as a maquette. You know, for some I put work on the ladder as a maquette, and then also use it just as you know a support for the work. Um, I feel like. I am, uh, there's not enough time for as much work as I want to make. I know I've made a lot, but I don't feel like I've made what I need to make yet. Um, large pieces, again, really, really excited about shadow, the interplay of the rhythms of growth. You can see the, even from the ceramic work, you can see in the paper some of the same ideas that I'm I'm carrying through. There's larger pieces. I I have someone that really helps me now um, install um, because it's I I can't do ladders anymore um, and heights I'm not good at either. And um, so he's helping me and so a lot of work that you see. Um, here I'm working on my back deck, starching a piece. I'm starting using pools, like the little plastic kid pools, and they're great. They're really, they're inexpensive and um, allows me to kind of move the work without making a mess. Uh, this piece has over 2,000 feet of copper wire that are hand thread during COVID. I just last week cut it all apart <laughs> after I spent two years doing it. I learned a lot. It wasn't right. It was better in my head than it was when I got it done, but I had to, I had to see it finished. Um, but I've recycled the, the copper 
into another piece. Uh, hanging, uh, hanging work um, with the layers of paper rings that I'm, I'm working with. This was at the Wright Gallery uh, last year, no, biennial. I love that photo on the left-hand side of that little boy. I don't know who he is, but that is, I love him, he, how he's looking up into it. This piece um, is about 30 feet tall. It has 11 rings of paper that takes months. This work is so labor intensive, but I love the process. I love working on this stuff. I don't feel like I have enough time to make it. I, If I could be working all the time, I would be. But unfortunately, I have to teach too. <laughs> but uh, you can see in the bottom right hand corner that somebody installing on a sister lift took two days to install. This was at the Springfield Museum. Um, um, it just came down in October um, or September. And um, I was just so excited to see that work hang, hanging in a, in a space where I could just critique it and because where I'm working in my house and in my studio, I mean, I see all the works in progress, but you don't get to see them done and see a finished thought. And so it was really nice to just kind of um, evaluate where I was going. And this brings me to uh, the current show, uh, the Nexus of Art and Health at the Wright Gallery. Um, and um, excited how the piece in the center turned out. I would not would not look like that if Kat Kat is wonderful and I she came in at the right time and it it just I love how it cause cascades down and and I have a thought about that because my studio is not large enough to see the works to play with the presentation and so the only time that I really get to see them finalizes in a venue so I haven't quite worked that out yet I I told my husband I need a bigger studio and so he's he's not sold on that idea yet. Um, hey, I, Lisa. Yeah. Let's just pause on this okay. and let's come to a Q and A portion. I, I love that you have this included, and I think anyone that wants to think about these things to help themselves stay motivated and focused, you can pause on this and dive into it. Yeah. So let's go to the slide that lets folks know how they can see more about your work. Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. So here is um, Lisa's email and her web address. If you've fallen in love with her work and you need more, this is where you can go to find that. Um, and let's just do a little bit of Q&A before we have to close up. Um, you talked wonderfully about your inspirations. I, I think that anyone watching this video will naturally be able to understand how these really deep rooted experiences are a through line in your work. It's, it's very apparent. What I would love to know is why did you switch to paper? Well, that's a great question. Um, and when, after grad school, when I was, I was in love with working on clay, uh, what happened is, is that I was in a car accident 
and um, I I had some some problems physically with my back, and then um, it kind of was a catalyst for uh, what what's going on with me now. Uh, I was diagnosed with ataxia which affects your muscles anyway. So kind of all kind of overlaid and my allergies got really bad. Your immune system is compromised when you have disease. And so I can no longer carry uh, the heavy works or carry the clay or actually fire the alternative processes that I was working with. Um, so I, I, I was, it was a really hard time for me as an artist. So I was drawing and painting, uh, a lot and, and I was working on a painting and hated what I was painting. I, I really just didn't like where it was going. And so I ripped it. I was working on a heavy vellum and I ripped the paper and I looked at it and I said, are you kidding me? That is so cool. I love that, that the way the paper tore, it was, it was, it had that mark making that I was so in love with anyway. Um, but, it, but when I ripped it, then I just, I started working with that in different variations and came up with, the process that I'm working with now. Wonderful. All right. If you want to stop screen share. And then my last question for you, um, what has been part of the nexus of art and health? What has that um, mentor been like for you being a part of such a really wonderful and, and specific exhibition? Well, you, you know, I, th I was just um, so honored to be contacted by Sienna uh, to be a part of this. Uh, it's so important to, to highlight artists working with this subject matter or dealing with this subject matter themselves. And it's inspirational. Um, for me as an artist, just to see how, what other artists are doing. I mean, and you have some amazing pieces. I mean, it just the, the works are, are beautiful and, and it keeps me moving. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you again, Lisa, for your great artist talk. Um, and thank you all for joining us for this artist talk by Lisa Merida Pates as a part of our programming for the Nexus of Art and Health curated by Sienna Brown. I'd like to give a special thank you to that curator. Thanks, Sienna, for putting together such a great show. To all of the participating artists, as well as to the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, and the governor who supports the OAC, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.